appreciate that very much. Well, if you brought your Bibles, let's turn in them to our passage this morning in Galatians chapter 2. So we'll be picking up from last week where we left off. We're going to resume in Galatians chapter 2, and we will be looking at verses 11 through 21. So that's Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. And the title of the message is Not Rebuilding What Was Destroyed. Uh, And you'll find the same information as well as the outline uh, on the back of your bulletin if you need that. Now, I'm sure none of us like confrontation, do we? Unfortunately, confrontation is part of life, and actually good can come out of confrontation if it's done in the right way. Of course, the reverse of that is always true as well. Paul once confronted the Apostle Peter, who was going back on something that he had already committed to. He had originally agreed upon a particular set of truth, if you will, or truths. And Paul is going to confront him because he changed his mind, you might say, in the way he lived that out. Peter wasn't teaching false doctrine. He was living falsely, you might say. And so although having confrontation and confronting others, especially believers, is not any fun, one of the things we'll find is that there are some helpful principles that we can learn from this encounter where Paul is going to confront very strongly publicly the Apostle Peter. And I wouldn't know about you, but I don't think I would want to do that. But Paul does, because Paul is more interested in pleasing the Lord and making sure the truth and the nature of the gospel is remains exactly what they had agreed upon. Uh, more on that later. If you'd like to follow along, I'll tell you sort of what we're going to look at as we go through this passage, because It's a little bit long in terms of the text, sort of like last week, but it all flows with this one thought. Notice in verses 11 through 13, confrontation at Antioch, followed by reminding what was already confirmed, verses 14 through 18, and then what we would call theologically our union in Christ, verses 19 through 21. Now, before I read this, the flow of it is sort of the way I have it there. Paul is going to say that at some point in the future, after they had made a particular agreement, which if you were here last week, I'll remind you of, Paul has to go and confront in Antioch the Apostle Peter. And then in the verses 14 through 18, as I read it, you'll begin to see why. Because Peter was living differently than he had said with his own mouth. And then in the very end, verses 19 through 21, Paul, in a sense, reminds us that you and I are all united in this sense. We have a union in Christ, and he focuses on Christ's death and resurrection. And so the ending there is that all individuals who have trusted in Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, all are one in Christ because they're all united in Christ. And their union is based off of dying to self, on the cross, and being raised to live a new life, uh, as we'll see later. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a taste of what we're looking at. So let's read the passage, and then we'll look at these uh, in detail. And if you haven't been with us, I will do a brief review. But let's just read the passage, verse 11 of Galatians 2. But when Cephas, of course that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For prior to come to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in, in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, If you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith But through faith in Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus 
so that we might be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no man will be justified. But if we, but if, excuse me, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Now, if we begin looking at this, uh, we'll notice, if you will, on the screen here, we have the outline of the book. Uh, I've mentioned a few times, Galatians does have a good structure to it. It's not as tightly bound, I think, as Romans. But nevertheless, after the introduction, Paul spends the remainder through what we just read defending his authority, his authority, of course, coming from God himself. And then next week, we'll move into a lengthy, although it's alluded to here, the discussion on justification by faith alone in Christ alone, and he will spend two chapters on this. Now, before we move on, I want you to consider something, just looking at the structure of it. Paul deals first with how we are just before God. In other words, Paul wants them to know how is one just and how does one receive the Holy Spirit first. Then he spends the last part of the chapters 5 and 6 telling them how to live by the Spirit of God. It makes no sense for him to say, let's live this way, let's live that way, if you don't know how to live without the Holy Spirit. You and I cannot live the Christian life. We cannot walk by faith. We cannot live the life that God has for us without the Holy Spirit. I think too often we start on this other end, don't we? If I can just get someone to come to church and if I can get them to do all the religious charades, then maybe they'll be right with God. And the Bible teaches the opposite. It teaches structurally what you see here. If you want to be right with God and live right, you must be justified first. There's no point in me asking you to live the Christian life if you don't have the righteousness of God in you. If you haven't been made declared righteous... There's no point if you don't have the Holy Spirit. So structurally, it's backwards from what we do today. Today, we focus on self. Paul says, no. First, you must know how to receive the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, how are you going to live by that which you don't have? So we see what Paul has been saying here. In the previous messages, the gospel, it is Christ over and over that changed Paul's life. Paul's life was changed when he encountered Jesus Christ. He wasn't changed by going through 10-step program or some psychological analysis when he came under conviction when he saw the risen Christ. And that's the way it is for you and I. Last week we saw that 14 years later he goes up and he defends the, if you will, liberty, the freedom that we have in Christ. And that freedom is this. Christ plus nothing equals eternity. Christ plus nothing equals eternal life. Christ plus anything is a false gospel. And that anything is circumcision in that way. You can fill that blank in today and we do the same thing. Well, I believe in Christ and then I also do this. That's you throwing the tip on salvation. And salvation is either done or not. And so Paul wants them to do this. And Paul is endorsed. In other words, his message is the same as the apostles. Now, notice the very ending there. I put an asterisk there. Because in order to understand this week, we have to understand where we left off. Where do we leave off? They all agreed. The apostles said, yep, to the Jew, go ahead, Peter. To the Gentile, you, Paul, We're all brothers in Christ. Look at verse 9 with me before we move into our passage this week. Notice in Galatians 2, 9, James, Cephas, meaning Peter and John, along with Barnabas, what do they do? 
they gave him the right hand of fellowship. They were all brothers in Christ. They all had agreed that Christ had come for the Jew and to the Gentile and that there was nothing that could be added to justification. Nothing. And so they all agreed upon it. But sometime later, in the future, Peter, who would agree to these things, walks and lives differently. He's like a straw in the wind and blew this way and blew that way. It was just depending on who his audience was. Whoever he was friends with that week, whoever he was with, is how he acted. Instead of acting the same over and over. So if you pick up here, you'll notice in verse 11, but anytime it's in the scripture that says but, 99.9% of the time it is the same thing I've mentioned to you before. This has been going on, everything's going great, but now something has changed. But he mentions here Cephas, and if you're not familiar with how this works, Peter is the man with many names. I don't know if you know that. Sometimes people get confused over all these names, and you can't blame them. Uh, But Cephas, or Simon, or Peter, how does this work? Jesus named him Cephas in John chapter 1 and verse 42. In Aramaic, it would be Peter. Petros is the Greek, the stone, if you will, and so forth. So that's the naming conventions. It's the man with many names, right? And so you know that many of these apostles, a lot of times you have the haters of the scripture that say, well, this list says this name and this one says that. It's because they had various names. Some of them have nicknames. I know some of the people here at church, you all have nicknames. And at first I thought, who in the world are you talking about? And then come to find out it's another person. It's the same sort of idea here. Now, I want to mention something to you here because it says that when Peter came to Antioch, Antioch is mentioned in the scripture a lot. Antioch was the hub, I like to think, of many of the missionary journeys. But there's two Antiochs. There's not the one here referred to, which is Pisidian, so you don't get confused. Um, This is a map of the missionary journeys of Paul. Essentially, the way to distinguish these is fairly easy. The one that is not Pisidian is the one that's just north of the region or the Sea of Galilee. That's where most of the missionary journeys in uh, the book of Acts, that's the hub. That's where they sent forth the church there in Antioch. But then there's another one there that is in Galatia, Asia type area there that Paul went to on his first missionary journey, and that is the one that is referred to Antioch of Pisidian. So there's two different ones. Uh, It doesn't really change anything with the text. I just want you to understand so you don't get confused here, which is what Paul is talking about is the one that's just a little north of the region or the sea there of Galilee. Now, how does Paul do this? Notice what it says in back in our passage here. So in verse 11, Peter comes up to Antioch there. That would be the one that's north of the region of Galilee. But Paul opposed him, notice, behind his back or to his face. You'll notice that there's a diametrical difference. That is one of the greed, the worst things that I have found with Christians sometimes is we are really good with not doing exactly what's up there, aren't we? The way in which you should encounter things is you should go to the person, whether it be privately or directly here, not behind the back. I want you to look with me in Psalm 15 because what we don't want to come away with is this idea That Paul was just in a bad mood. He woke up on the wrong side of the floor on the cot that morning and decided he was just going to tear into Peter. That's not the idea there. But Psalm 15, verses 1 through 3, I think is helpful here. Because what I want you to see is the reverse is what's called gossip and slander. It would be saying, okay, I'm upset with this person. And I'll tell you as a pastor... Nine times out of ten, do you know what I have found? The person has no idea they've done it, and you don't ever go and tell them, and then they end up butting heads, right? And then the church splits because you've got somebody that ate the last piece of apple pie. They didn't know that that was offensive, and then you have to have a big church hoopla over it. Most churches don't divide over doctrine. They divide over silly, 
ridiculous things. But notice here Psalm 15, and we're just going to read verses 1 through 3. O Lord, who may abide, that is meno, and that means to remain in your tent. Who may dwell on your holy hill? He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. He does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up reproach, notice, against his friend. That explains everything there. That is what we should be doing, is what Paul does. Whenever you have an issue with somebody, go and talk to them privately. Go and take care of it the biblical way. Don't go behind the back because you're not going to ever solve anything. Peter goes, of course, in error, but Paul goes and confronts him. But let's go back to our passage here. What's the issue, though? I mean, Peter's Jewish, and it takes a while to get the Jewishness, in other words, these things out of him, but that's not the problem. Uh, that is what a lot of times people get hung up on. They're saying, well, Peter was Jewish, and so it takes him a while to get some of these things out of his mind. Paul has already said, if you want to be circumcised, have at it. But circumcision doesn't make you justified before Almighty God any more so than anything else does. There's only one thing that justifies you before God, and it's the cross, the death, burial, the resurrection of Jesus. There's a lot of stuff after it. We like to take the other stuff and add it to that. And that's what's called workspace salvation. And that's not what Paul teaches. But what is the issue here? What does he get called on the carpet for? Well, if you notice, it's pretty straightforward. We don't have any renderings or other accounts of this in the book of Acts. But you'll notice in verse 12, For prior to the coming of certain men from James, this would be, of course, the Jewish audience is what he's referring to here. Peter used to eat with the Gentiles, but when the bigwigs came from the Jerusalem, he changed his mind and played a different tune. So Peter originally was okay with being with the Gentiles, but then when the hierarchy and other Jewish believers came, he flipped the script. He acted one way here, and then he acted one way here. That's the charge that Peter is being blamed with. In other words, he's being blamed with the word that's used there in verse 13 twice. Notice hypocrisy. He was acting one way here, one way here, one way here. He just couldn't make his mind up who or what he was going to fall to. This goes back to what I keep telling you. Galatians 1.10 is so important to understand at least theologically, what is Paul's point in this letter? For am I now seeking the favor of men or God? What was Peter doing seeking the favor of men? He wanted audience A happy at this time and then audience B happy at this time. And then when they come together, he doesn't know what to do because he's wearing two face. Do you know what the word hypocrisy or where the idea comes from? Well, if you see there's a picture up there that cool guy with the mask there, and he's got the mask sort of like that. The Greek word I put up there for you if you're interested in studying it, Peter is not being charged with false doctrine but false living. That's the simplest way I can explain to you. He's not charged here with a false doctrine. His belief was fine. He just wasn't living it out the right way. He was coming to church, saying all the amens, and then as soon as they left, what was he doing? taking off the mask that he had put on when he went to the church service, so to speak. In Greek, what it means, it means to pretend, it means to play a part. It's a pretty strong charge here. How do you understand this? Well, in Greek theater, how many of you have ever been to a Greek play? Maybe you haven't been. In the Greek theater, this is described beautifully, and that's what Paul's referring to. It's the man up there. He's got the pseudo-tuxedo, and he's got a mask in this hand, And he's person A right now. Then when he goes to the church, he puts on, is what Paul's saying, the mask. And that's what the white mask is. That's what Greek theater was. He played the part of the Christian. He played the part of following through with all the amens. But then when he left, he took it off. And what was he? He was A again. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. 
That is what hypocrisy is. It is to come to perform and do a performance. It's to be one way here and one way there. You should be one all the time, whether you're talking to one person or not. You should always be the same person either way. But notice tragically in verse 13, there's a nuance there of a word. Notice what it says. Even Barnabas. Really? Why would he put this in here? How many of you, if you were here on Wednesday night, you already know this? Because I studied recently Barnabas and I weaved Barnabas' life in because he's referenced here. Barnabas was the encourager. He was seen as a stalwart for the faith. He was the man who was entrusted with, if you will, the money bag. He was seen as the high echelons, if you will, of of early Christianity. He was the man to follow after. If you were going to follow somebody, follow Barnabas. But notice what Paul says. Even Barnabas was led astray into hypocrisy. What's Paul's point? Paul's point is, don't be so sure you won't be either. I have known good Christians, and I can name them right off the top of my head, who have been led astray by others' unchristlike behavior. Be careful who you follow, and if that person is doing something that is unbiblical, you need to stop following them. Just because someone is a Christian doesn't mean they can't fall prey to this. Even Barnabas, even what? Fill in your name. Even Stephen, even, you get the point? Don't be so sure because there's a lot of Christians who are this way and they lead astray many others. So is confrontation bad or is it good? I call it yes, but. Because how should confrontation be? I think what happens in the church is what I like to do this. Mm Hmm. And hope it goes away. No, it won't go away. It only gets worse. Confrontation, in my view, is a yes, but. Look at Galatians 6.1. You'll see where Paul drills home the application, if we will. The problem in modern Christianity is we are so narcissistic. You'd rather me start in 5 and 6 and skip the whole th- beginning piece. You won't be able to do this if you aren't in Christ. There's no point to even read it. Because you need the imputed, if you will, righteousness of Jesus clothed in it. But you need the Holy Spirit in order to do what? Walk by the Spirit rather than the flesh. But notice how this is supposed to work. Brethren, if anyone, notice there's no exclusion. And I am of that way. I don't care how long you've been at this church. I don't care how much money you give. I don't care what you do, what your last name is. If you are in sin, you are not above what the Scripture teaches. Notice what he says. Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, but notice, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you will not be tempted. You notice the goal and the aim is not to destroy but to restore. If I could change one thing in our church constitution, I would rephrase church discipline only because it has a bad connotation today. It is supposed to be church restoration. Because that is what the goal is. We have this idea that we're supposed to beat the tar out of the person and kick them out of the church. No, it's to restore the person because they are out of fellowship, most importantly, with the Lord. And that is what it is. So what do we see in verses 11 through 13? Gossip and slander behind the back. Is that biblical or unbiblical? You answer it. Confrontation in the Spirit of God always biblical, always done the right way for the right reason to restore the person not only horizontally but more importantly vertically. But let's go back here and let's pick up here because in verses 14 through 18 we have, of course, this continuation here where Paul essentially is going to remind Peter what they already agreed on. This is where I get the title from. Because what Paul is doing is he's coming saying, you said one thing here, now you're changing your mind. You need to backtrack and get yourself straight. 
Go back to what we agreed to. Now, if you notice in verses 14 through 15, that's quite a strong charge there. Notice, but when I saw that they were not straightforward, notice this is where, again, I told you the title of the sermon series, the truth of the gospel, the gospel and the truth of it is at stake. He told Cephas this strong charge, Peter that is, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles, what does that mean? He and the Jews would have thought Gentiles were sinners. Gentiles were seen by the Jews as sinners. If you being a Jew live like a sinner and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the sinners to live like the Jews? That's what he's saying. Doing as I say, not as I do. How many of you have parents have ever been charged that way from your parents, or from your kids? You told me to do this, but you do. That's sort of what Paul is getting at there. But most importantly, what he does in verse 16 is he's reminding him that the Jew and the Gentile, when they have done something, they are unified and there is unity. What makes all of us unified is if you have trusted and believed and accepted verse 16. Notice, nevertheless, Paul says, Jew or Gentile, they are one. Don't live like a sinner and then go out and say, don't sin. I mean, that's pretty strong. Can you imagine Paul... Going to Peter, who is the upper echelon, probably not on the same level, maybe about equal, with James there at the church of Jerusalem, with all these Judaizers, and he says, why don't you live out what you actually preach? My goodness. And then notice what he says. He says, nevertheless, knowing that a man is justified, notice towards the end of the verse, so that we may be justified... The content of the truth of the gospel is that we are justified by faith in Christ, not by the law. This is what's going to move us into the later sections, which is what does the law, how does the law relate to the believer? But what I want us to focus on here is what is justification? If I have anything as a pastor that people miss is this. They think sanctification is justification and everything gets all squirrely from there. What is justification? I'm going to read you a little bit longer definition than normal. It is the legal act wherein God, notice, not you, not Pastor Pace, no one, where God pronounces that the believing sinner has been credited all the virtues of Jesus Christ. Whereas forgiveness is the negative aspect of salvation, meaning the subtraction of human sin. Notice justification is the positive aspect, meaning the addition of divine righteousness. We are forgiven. That's the negative. We are having the sins removed. The positive is justification because what happens is that God declares you righteous. You're not righteous. He declares you righteous by what Christ has done, and he clothes you in Christ's righteousness. This shows the contrast of what God does for us versus what we think we can do for ourselves. That is what Paul is trying to get across here. We can never make ourselves right before God, because if that was the case, what's the point of the law? And if the law justifies, why did Christ come to begin with? And so that is what we're looking at. Then we see here in verse 18 what Paul's point is. And Paul's point there in verse 18 follows, of course, verse 17, which is the charge that he anticipates. The charge that Paul anticipates in verse 17 is, okay, so you're saying that I trust in, in faith, into Jesus Christ, I received the Holy Spirit, I have been imputed the righteousness of Jesus, and so basically I can go live any way I want to. He anticipates the charge in verse 17 and says grace doesn't promote sin. And this is what he will feed into later. What we confuse ourselves with is sanctification. Sanctification is when God is forming you more and more into Christ's image, because you have the indwelling Holy Spirit, because you can't walk by the Spirit if you don't have it. 
And so what Paul says is, look, grace doesn't promote a sinful lifestyle. What grace promotes is justification so that you can begin living the right way, which we'll see later. But you'll see verse 18, and this is really the whole point of what Paul is getting at in its allusion to Peter. Notice, for if I rebuild what I once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. This is alluding to what Peter was doing. Peter had said, okay, fine. You came to the church in Jerusalem and you said, all right, fine. Jew and Gentile are the same as long as they have trusted in Jesus. They don't have to have circumcision. The Gentile doesn't. We're all one in Christ. But Peter, of course, capitulated to fear of man and began to play a part. He acted one way here. He acted one way. And so basically what Paul says is you're going back and rebuilding what Christ has destroyed. Christ has already destroyed this, if you will, disunity. Let me ask you this. How are we one in Christ? You ever thought about that? You know, a church body is one in Christ, and we're all equal. I have pastored now three churches and served in four, and I hate to tell you this, I've never found one superior Christian in any of the four. They're all one, they're all equal. How could that be, though? Look with me in Galatians 3. So turn to Galatians 3. I want to read verses 27 through 28 because Paul is harping on this over and over. The unity that we have at Decatur Bible Church is because hopefully, Lord willing, we are all in Christ. Because Christ is the one who can bring together all of the, if you will, nations and all of these different types of people. Notice what it says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. That's what we've just been talking about. Notice verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor free female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus Unity is based on truth, the truth that Christ in us, we are all equal, we are unified, and we are all united under the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have known some Christians who almost think of themselves as superior to other people. Have you ever known people like that? Oh my goodness. Well, we're better than them. They just don't know it yet. Uh, And that is not what the scripture teaches. It's sort of like sometimes I've seen people say, if you would just act this particular way, which, by the way, is the same way I act, we'd all be united together. That is not what the Bible teaches. What makes the gospel so beautiful is, do you know that we have missionaries that take the gospel to Ukraine? They can take it anywhere, and everyone can be united in Christ. That's the beauty of the gospel. That was something that Judaism could not do. It's not a criticism of it, but that is one of the things there that Paul is saying. We are united under the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we are all one, we are all equal. There is not one Christian in the four churches I have been at that is greater than anyone else, and if you find one, let me see it. Because I have never found that anywhere, except in some people's minds. But notice verses 19 to 21, how Paul sort of brings us to a crescendo. Because Paul is going to conclude and say, we are all one in Christ because we all have unity in Christ. This is what we call theologically union in Christ. That Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do you know you have the indwelling of God Almighty in you? And it's centered on, if you notice, death and resurrection. Death and life, in other words. Let's reread verses 19 through 20. And as we read these Paul is, in a sense, saying something in verse 19. And then, have you ever done this, said something, and said, let me say it more clearly. That's what he does in verse 20. Notice what he says in verse 19 is the same thing he says in verse 20. He just explains himself, you might say. Notice, for through the law I died to the law. So that's the death. Notice the rest. So that I might live to God. So that's death and life. What does verse 20 say? Paul says, if you didn't understand what that is, let me explain it using my own life. 
I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. That's the death of Paul. But, now we see the life. But Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me so that I might have salvation. So what you see here as we move into these is the law brings death. So Paul is beginning to move into the section of Galatians where he's going to deal with the law. Have you ever wondered how the law relates to the Christian? You won't have too much longer. Paul is going to say the law is good. Actually, the law is great. Do you know why the law is great? It shows the holiness and perfection of God and that you aren't. In other words, it shows us that we are sinners and that God is the only one in all of creation that's holy. That is in many ways what the law does. The law, of course, points us to the very fact that we need somebody to bridge the, ga- the chasm there. Because notice what Paul says at the end in verse 21 before we go back one last time to 19 and 20. Notice what he says rhetorically. Okay, then fine. If the law and you and your self-righteousness could be achieved, then what was the point of Christ's death? Why even bother? Why go through all of that if you could achieve salvation on your own? That is the message today and throughout over 2,000 years of church history, I think, which is the opposite of that. Man still thinks I can somehow put on the tip of salvation. I can somehow contribute and take credit for it. And Paul says, if you could do anything, then why did Christ even come? Because God had already given you the law. But go back with me here. Bear with me before we finish, because I want to drill this home, because I know verse 20 is one that's well known. But notice what it is, and I ask you to consider, is this true of yourself? Because there's nothing in the church constitution that we have here at Decatur Bible Church other than the gospel and the proclamation of justification. None of those things can save you. Notice what Paul says here in verses 19 and 20. They're basically saying the same thing. For for through the law I died to the law. Notice verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Paul's dead. Self-righteous Paul died on the road to Damascus, my friends. Paul's attempt to earn salvation, self-righteousness, he himself and all of his sins were nailed to the cross. Christ's death paid Paul's sins. And Paul says, I trust, I believe that God has done everything through Christ and he nailed it, my sins on the cross. And what does that say? It says God's satisfied because his son was the only one who could pay it. Paul died on the road to Damascus. But then notice the life. He says in verse 19, I died, but then what does he say? I live now to God. What does it say in verse 20? Christ lives in me and the life I live now. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Paul now lived... His new life empowered by that which lived in him. The new life was Jesus Christ living in him, the Holy Spirit. Some of those things we'll see later on. Put it to you simply this way. Death was Paul's sins nailed on the cross. Paul's old life was buried, in a sense, in the tomb with Jesus. But when Jesus raised again, it pictures exactly what happens to a dead, wretched sinner, which is what? Christ paid Stephen's penalty of sin. I died to Stephen a long time ago, and I was raised to walk in newness of life. That is what Romans 6, 7 teaches. But you cannot be raised by what you do. You raised by what has been done. I'm going to read this to you before we look to finish up. I, th- I thought it was helpful. Uh, if it doesn't help, then don't worry about it. But notice the two tensions here, because I want you to understand both. It is how we are saved and how we are to then go and live. Legally, God looks at us as if we had died with Christ. We are no longer condemned for our sins because that price has been paid. 
But notice how are we supposed to live. Relationally, we share in Christ's sufferings and have died to our old way of living. Now, excuse me, He now indwells us through the Holy Spirit, empowering us to live a life of obedience. If you want to live a life of obedience, you must live it through the power of the Holy Spirit. So confrontation is great, isn't it? Well, I think so, because we wouldn't have this passage otherwise. Confrontation should always be done in the spirit of Galatians 6 once. Amen, friends? We cannot avoid that, but we can do it the right way. Two, I plead with you to understand we are all one in Christ. There is no one here that sits at this church that is better than anyone else, and if they are, I want to know who they are. Three, am I trying to please the Lord through my performance or allowing my new life in Christ to empower me to serve him. And I hope it's the latter. Father, I thank you for today and an opportunity to gather for a time of Sunday school this morning, a time of singing of your praises. Father, I pray that we take this confrontation not from the negative, but from the positive, Lord, that sometimes confrontation is necessary, Lord, but it should be done in the right spirit, with the attitude of restoration. Father, I pray that none of us, Lord, please forgive us if we ever have this idea that we are better than someone else. Lord, we are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all on different spiritual paths, spiritual walks, if you will. But Father, I pray that never be the case here. Lord, I also pray that we not try to please you through performance because, Lord, it'll be a long, difficult life if we do. Rather, what we do is what Paul says. We live a life by faith in Christ, and we live that life now empowered to do what we cannot on our own. Father, I thank you for today. Be with us as we leave and return us again later this evening where we can worship you again in spirit, but also in the truth of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please rise as we close the service in uh, song with Bind Us Together, then Elliot will come up.